If you witnessed a murder and had to scale a 10,000 foot rock face to stay away from the people trying to kill you, what would you do? Kelly is an actual rock climber with years of experience under her belt. Unfortunately, she has no experience keeping a bunch of trust fund affluenza killers from coming after her when they her friend and catch her recording the whole thing on her camera. With almost nowhere else to go, she tests her physical limits and takes on the vertical wall of one of Italy's tallest mountains. Let's find out if she can outclimb, but more importantly, outsmart these psychos. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the affluenza killers in the ledge. Kelly and Sophie have shacked up in a cabin at the base of the Dolomite Range in northeastern Italy. They've come here to climb the 10,000 foot tall sheer face of Monte Antelo, the highest mountain in the range. Unfortunately, they're not alone. The next cabin over is rented by four trust fund brats who graduated from the Golden Toupee School for Affluenza and Money Laundering. These are the sort of Wall Street bros that make you wonder just how real a movie like Hostel really is. And it's immediately clear that even if one of these guys died, the world would be a much better place. Reynolds, Zach, and Taylor are basically interchangeable. The worst of them, Josh, is so awful, even the other guys can't stand him. Because you're working for some congressman doesn't mean you can forget your friends. You might be able to fool those in Washington, you stink, but don't forget how far we go back. This is why you don't invite the guy who knows all your secrets and can buy his way out of prison to your weekend vacation. Did you want to ruin this trip before it even started? Josh wastes no time introducing himself to the ladies and inviting them to their campfire. The conversation's light and friendly at first. Sophie easily navigates the flirtatious banter of $10,000 wristwatches and pokes fun at them for their Maseratis. Turns out that expensive wristwatch actually has a function. A life alert built in that will send an SOS and the location coordinates if he turns a certain dial. I wonder if that's gonna come in handy later. Kelly decides to turn in for the night, and despite Josh being a shoe-in with Sophie, he does this. Why don't you stay? Let go my arm. Because that's a normal, well-adjusted reaction. I thought she wanted to get laid. After Kelly's gone, things go downhill insanely fast. Josh keeps topping off Sophie's drink to get her drunk, while Reynolds limply tries to get him to stop. Josh tries to invite himself along their climb of the sheer face of Monte Antelo, and Sophie playfully insults them, saying that they wouldn't stand a chance since they were planning on taking the tourist's baby stroll up the other side of the mountain. And yeah, a hiking trail with demarcated paths and a max 45 degree incline is gonna be easier than scaling 10,000 feet of 90 degree rock face. Unfortunately, because Josh is a caveman, he responds to her playful rebuffs by waiting until she goes to in the woods before trying to rape her. He scared me. Hey, slow down, cowboy. Don't have the balls. Isn't that what you said? Dude, dude, she already wanted to sleep with you. I'd say this was self-sabotage, but I think you're just in it for the power struggle. Reynolds barrels in from the side and knocks Josh away, giving Sophie the chance to run. But afterward, they decide they have to track her down and talk to her. Uh-huh. Sophie! Come on, we're not gonna hurt you. Sophie! Yo, where are you? Don't stop, Sophie. Run faster. Get back to your cabin. Get numbers on your side. Get the out of there. Two against four is still poor odds, but way better than running blindly into the Italian Alps without a compass, light, or weapon. At the very least, take off your bright red coat and hang it on a nearby tree to lure them one way while you run the other. This bunch of Albright scholars are giving her every reason to avoid them. There is no way to paint what happened here in a good light. Josh looks like a predator no matter how you spin it, which means if we're forced to think like these Ivy League legacy alum, their best bet is to go back to camp, pack up, and leave, and let Sophie come back on her own. But of course, they can't really do that. Everyone here is an American, which means they all know there's the slightest chance of this incident ruining one of their careers one day. Sophie knows that too. All the more reason to throw off the coat and circle around back to the camp as fast as you can. If they actually meant her no harm here, their only real course of action would be to go back to camp, make a show of putting Josh and child lock up in the backseat of their SUV and wake Sophie up to explain what happened so she can call out to Sophie and guide her back to camp.
even as the bad guys. That sounds like a much easier way to kill both of them quickly. Instead, she hesitates just long enough to score a nat 1 in stealth and get spotted by all of them. Taylor grabs her from behind. She bites his hand. The totally normal response to someone clamping their hand over your mouth while whispering bull to you. But Josh is still running that caveman software. Kelly hears the commotion and emerges from the cabin to find the campfire abandoned. The guys circle around down to the spot where Sophie is still very alive, but too wounded to move. Reynolds pulls out his phone to call the emergency line, but Josh throws his phone away. What about this? How long do you think it'll take for them to realize there was a fight? Maybe quit making worse for yourselves. What started out as an attempted assault has progressed to attempted murder faster than it took you to bribe all your college professors for passing grades. Basically, they just Usain bolted their way from a three-month jail sentence to a minimum sentence of 12 years in Italy. Like the spineless weasels they are, Taylor and Zach side with Josh and decide to kill her. Even dumber when we find out this isn't the first murder Josh has gotten away with. Are you kidding me? Whoever brought this rabid dog on holiday is responsible for putting him down. Josh picks up a rock to finish Sophie off. Reynolds tries to intervene and Josh pulls out a knife and threatens him too, saying he's either with him or against them. Or how about you three realize that he's just as much a danger to you as he is to this rando chick he's about to murder. This is your lifelong friend threatening to skewer your other lifelong friend. I feel like there's a bro code violation going on here. Josh smashes Sophie's skull in. Then for extra psychopathy, he forces each of his friends to take the bloody rock and hit her too, making them all responsible. <laughs> Oh yeah, just splash that forensic evidence all over you. Then they wipe the viscera on Reynolds' hands too. Instead of, oh, I don't know, leaving, the Chads linger by the body talking before scraping Josh's DNA from under Sophie's fingernails and wasting time tossing her over an even higher cliff. Smooth. Now all your coat fibers are on her and anyone with half a brain will walk up the cliff, see all that raspberry jelly on the rocks and know her body was moved after she died. So much for her accidental fall. You know, if y'all just left right now, rather than chit-chatting, drove to the airport and went home tonight, none of the rest of this movie would happen. After forgetting how to walk for a while, Kelly pulls out her camera and arrives to a vantage point where she watches the guys toss her friend's body over the cliff. Instead of remaining quiet and leaving with the video evidence of Sophie's murder, she suddenly calls out for absolutely no reason. This movie ends right here if she just quietly backtracks to camp and drives down to the nearest city with a police station while they're busy mansplaining their villain origin stories to each other. Despite tripping over nothing several times and almost losing her camera, she manages to escape them. Sort of. She lucks into encountering Reynolds, the only non-murdery bro of the group who lets her go. She rushes to her cabin. But because the rest of this movie has to happen, instead of grabbing the keys to her truck parked a few feet away and hightailing it back to other people, she grabs her climbing gear and lets them chase her to the base of Monte Antelo. <laughs> she maxed out one of her agility trees. Taylor starts climbing after her without ropes or clamps. Unfortunately, he's fast enough to quickly catch up with her. She kicks him back the first time, but not hard enough to make him fall. The second time he grabs her, the camera tumbles out and he takes all of her carabiners with him. He falls 10 feet before latching onto a small ledge. He tells his friends to go for the rest of their gear. They're too busy being the Greek chorus Taylor deserves, just not the one he needs right now. Kelly doubles back to grab the camera, giving Taylor time to catch up to her again. This time, she ends this Lion King homage the only way she knows how. <laughs> Please tell me she's gonna drop a rock on his head later. I kinda appreciate that this movie isn't insta-killing the people falling from great heights onto nature's jagged concrete. I mean, any fall above 39 feet is considered in the death zone. But he didn't hit his head, only his spine, which as we all know, has Wolverine level healing capabilities. Despite falling square on his back, splattering blood like a punctured waterbed, he seems to have only shattered the tibia on his right leg. And I 
I do mean shattered. The bone shards basically hollowed out his leg while trying to eject. It's the sort of wound a farmer might use his shotgun to fix. Just stop our getting back to the cabin. But instead of finding a makeshift tourniquet to prevent their buddy from bleeding to death, Josh blames Reynolds for letting Kelly escape and warns him he's just as guilty as they are. Through the power of movie magic, the guys somehow carry Taylor back to the cabin. They wrap some sort of leather cord around his thigh and use a windlass stick for mechanical support to cut off the blood supply. Then, they give him the triage equivalent of a smoke and a reach around. Here. <laughs> 24 hours, okay? If we're not back by then, you call for help. Making your actions seem so stupid, you can't be held accountable later. Nice. Forcing random pills and alcohol on a guy who needs a tourniquet to stop his own body from rushing all his blood to the brand new emergency exit in his shin, and then telling him not to call for medical help for 24 hours feels pretty calculated to me. Gonna go out on a limb and say Josh is trying to rid himself of one more loose thread. I mean, he's gotta be, right? They don't all need to climb to catch her. If they do catch her, then waiting doesn't matter anyway. And someone staying behind at camp prevents her from being able to get away even if she does make it off the mountain. Not to mention gangrene, or tissue death caused by a loss of blood supply, can become fatal in as little as 48 hours. They're leaving Taylor here to die, is what I'm saying. On the rock face, Kelly wedges herself into a vertigo-inducing shallow nook to rest and put on her climbing shoes. She chocks her hands and prepares to continue climbing. A setup only a little better than this would be all she needs to beat these guys. But we'll get back to that in a minute. Down below, the guys return, now geared up to follow her up the rock face. Zach reminds Josh that Sophie was right. None of them have the skill to climb this wall. Josh isn't too concerned, saying they'll climb to the shoulder of the trail part of the way, then walk up the rest until they're above her and can wait for her to come to them. Back with Kelly, she encounters the dangerous, venomous, terrifying gray snake. Seriously, I could not find anything on a snake like this with silver spots along its back. But just grab and fling. A snake shower is the last thing anyone below is expecting right now. The guys begin their ascent, packing so much it's an unbelievable miracle of some sort when a few moments later, Kelly stops for a sip of water and they caught up to her. How exactly? Did the editor skip over Kelly's extended nap? The problem with a situation like this is that geographically, we can't know the topography of any given place along this climb. Here, for example. It looks like she's a few feet from a ledge deep enough to sit on, so why would she rest here? Especially since she drops her only source of water seconds later. Down below, Josh taunts her, revealing that he grabbed her phone earlier. He claims he's posting to her social media from her account, talking about meeting him and his friends. His phone beeps like he's telling the truth. He doesn't seem that stupid, but for your sake, I kinda hope he is. Sure, he could write some pretty terrible and incriminating things on your socials, but in in the event of your death, he has created a pretty easy paper trail back to him and his friends, especially after the boneheaded choice to move Sophie's body away from the ledge where they caved her head in. Kelly comes to a difficult spot on the face where a previous climber installed a piton with a small rope attached to help swing to the next hole. She's too short to reach it. Thinking quickly, she rips a hole in her pack, pulls one of the structural wires out, and uses it to bring the rope within reach. She swings across and continues to a long, abandoned, wind-tattered tent attached to the rock face. The guys make it to the trail and arrive on the ledge right above her only a few minutes later. All we want is that camera. Tie the camera to the rope and nobody's gonna get hurt, okay? This is some wily e. Coyote bull when they reel up the line and see she hasn't attached the camera, Josh threatens she's only got one chance left. But before what, Josh? You gonna come down here and take the camera from me? Please do. Let me fling your Manhattan into the void. They drop the rope again, and this time she sends back a Dear John go f self letter. Kind of tame, but then again, her fingers are aching from the climb, and by now, she's probably suffering from intense hypoglycemia, with nothing to do but wait until she drops from exhaustion. Everyone settles in for the long haul. Kelly wraps her brutalized hands with tape to seal tears and wounds. Reynolds tells Zach that there's no fire smoke rising from the cabin. Mmm. 
I think your friend is dead, and not from the leg wound. Something Zack all but confirms a few minutes later. With nightfall coming, Kelly puts out an ultralight Camelot, a spring-loaded jamming device that allows climbers to secure their rope. The cam lobes that wedge into the crevice in a rock are made in the shape of a logarithmic spiral, so that friction keeps the cam from falling out while the climber is putting their weight on the rope. She secures the cam to the bottom of the ledge above her, and then goes through the tent, finding some stale water and a small tool with a sharpened edge. She secures the tent to the cam. Hard pass. Kelly beds down to try and rest, but Josh has other plans. They tie off one of their bags and hurl it over the ledge. For some reason, this inspires her to leap out of the tent and dangle from the edge. Why exactly? A mystery. You could have just exited the nylon sack and then taken your time keeping all the goodies inside that bag for yourself. The orange bag swings again and she grabs onto it, completely apart from the rock. Josh notices the tension on the line and sees her dangling. He tells the others to let go. The rope securing the bag pulls taut. The bag drops, but Kelly holds fast. Zack tosses Josh a knife. He cuts the line. Kelly grabs onto her original ledge with milliseconds to spare and watches the bag disappear into the clouds below. As far as contrived drama goes, it's pretty intense. But again, if you trust that cam to hold your weight dangling several kilometers over open air, you trust it to hold while you carefully exit the tent and keep the bag full of resources you desperately need rather than reenacting cliffhanger. A little while later, Kelly wakes up Suddenly, she hears movement and a knife pierces the flimsy canvas. It gets her in the leg before Zack's head peeks inside. He grabs her, dangling her half out of the tent and demanding the camera. He tosses her aside, giving her the chance to grab the tent's sharp tool and stab him repeatedly. She gets her hands on his knife, but instead of slicing right through the single rope holding him to the mountain and letting him fall to his death without taking her with him, she does this. <laughs> Kelly, you need to have a serious talk with your therapist after this. I mean, we all feel the call of the void now and then, but not this literally. She warns Zack that Josh is the kind of friend who dropped them both just to kill her, and he doesn't disagree. She stabs the knife into his thigh, forcing him to call for help and tosses her pack back into the tent as they pass. When they reach the ledge, Josh grabs for her, but she slices with a knife and he releases. She narrowly catches the tent, then gets onto her small ledge with her pack right before the tent falls. Holy convenient timing. I feel like the Camelot brand did not offer their endorsement for this. The problem with this entire situation is that even though she's slowly wounding these guys one by one, she has no food, no water, and no weather protection. It is close to freezing in the Dolomites after dark, and she still has to leave the mountain once they're no longer a threat. The longer she's out here, the more certain her demise. Basically, this is 127 hours, except instead of losing her arm, her body's going to start shutting down from sheer strain and lack of resources long before the guys do. They brought food, they still have water, and at night, they're sleeping in sleeping bags. Ideally, she would have stopped much lower down, in one of those very shallow cave ledges far below that I pointed out earlier. From there, she could have waited for one or two scenarios to occur. Scenario one, they come for her there, and she's waiting with a rock to smash or her legs to kick them off one by one until they get the message loud and clear that she has the high ground and ain't giving it up. Scenario 2. They go around to the easy trail where they have limited visibility of her, expecting her to keep climbing. Instead, she begins descending. Free climbers usually use ropes to rappel back down to the ground when they've reached the summit or they just walk down the easier side of the mountain. In this scenario, she would be moving downward, basically in reverse, feeling for toeholds. I'm not saying it's not risky. I am saying it's a much more feasible option when you've only climbed 500 feet up a 10,000 foot rock wall. Now that she's trapped on this narrow ledge, not 15 feet below the edge of the easy trail back down the mountain, those options are just plain unfathomable. Killing Zack was also an option. Had she sliced through Zack's rope, she would have at least narrowed their numbers. I know she's a good person, trying to earn that zero kill game achievement, but every second she waits brings her closer to a physical weakness that traps her on that ledge forever. Well, at least until her body can't sit up by itself 
herself anymore from exhaustion, and she splats out anyway. Her best option, and one she should have started on right before sundown when she could still see, but it wouldn't be easy to track her, is to climb sideways about 50 feet, then up onto the easy trail beyond where they can see her from their ledge. From there, she could have made it back to camp before they even realized she was gone. Kelly manages to nearly fall asleep, despite all the bickering above her, as the guys rehash all of the many best friend badges Josh has earned over the years, including one for routinely sleeping with Zach's girlfriend. Isn't this the part where you just, like, vote him off the ledge with a Leonidas kick? Oh yeah, remember what I said about Josh tying up loose ends? Reynolds wakes up and notices Zach is missing. Josh claims he went back down to join Taylor and call for medical evacuation. He tosses out a couple more bald-faced lies and Reynolds tells him he'll go down to get the camera. He says Kelly wouldn't trust Josh if he was hogtied in a magneto cage, which is definitely true, and then promises to kill her so they can leave. Reynolds rappels down to Kelly and tells her he won't kill her. He gives her a can of food and then apologizes about Sophie's accident. He offers to tell Josh that he pushed her off the cliff if she'll hand over the camera. Zachary, the guy you attacked yesterday, gone back down the trail. He's dead. I saw his body drop from that ledge. I stabbed a knife in his leg. Do you really think he got up and walked out of here? Is, is this a revelation, Reynolds? You're the only dude who 100% knows she's telling the truth. And do you know what that means? That means you're in she reluctantly gives him the camera, then screams to go along with his plan of pretending he threw her off the ledge. Reynolds assents, but Josh discovers the memory card isn't in the camera. Clever girl. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for Reynolds, who picks up the phone and dials Taylor's number back at base camp. Josh's bag starts ringing. Rookie move. If she kept the memory card and you supposedly tossed her off the mountain, maybe suggest heading back down to pick it off her smashed up body. There's probably no need. A fight breaks out, and Reynolds is almost immediately overpowered. The hammer is taken from him, then used to beat him. But because Josh just has to overcomplicate things, tossing him from the cliff to make it look like an accident he could actually explain won't cut it. He binds Reynolds' wrists and ankles with their climbing rope. I'm sending you a gift, Kelly! He lights Reynolds on fire, then kicks him over the ledge to dangle in front of her before the rope snaps and he falls to his death. Kelly notices the knife she took off Zack, wedged in a nearby rock, and retrieves it. See, she could have totally navigated a few feet farther down the easy trail and climbed up. Josh finally drops down to finish Kelly himself. She has the knife, but very little stability. But she swings too high, and he grabs her arm. She should have swung low across his thigh, an area he has to make vulnerable as he kicks off the wall to get closer to her. Then, while he's reaching for that, cut his rope. Instead, she kicks him back, giving him time to grab his hammer. He swings, slicing into her thigh. He grabs her leg, forcing her off her feet. She distracts him momentarily, claiming she hid the card in a nearby hole and regains her footing. He swings back and pins her, punching, then choking her. With her last bit of strength, she knees him in the balls, slices the rope, and stabs him. He dangles, begging for help. She reaches down and turns on the SOS function on his watch. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Kelly waits until dawn and summits the mountain as a rescue chopper bears down on her location. Knowing what happened with the Amanda Knox case in Italy, I bet that's gonna be one hell of an interrogation. This entire movie never happened, but it especially never happened since it relies on her randomly alerting them to her location after they tossed Sophie's body off the cliff. Once trapped on the rock face, her best option was to find a ledge deep enough to sit and rest in, low enough to the ground that she could climb back down safely. After she got done tossing the psycho bros to their deaths. Higher than a few hundred feet, and her options dwindle. Her survival depends on whether they could reach the ledge above her faster than she can climb, and whether she's too exhausted to move laterally along the wall until she can reach the easy trail without drawing their attention. For those reasons, I think the ledge was beaten. And remember, leave your psychotic childhood friend to fend for himself.